Listen to this. The V10 era of Formula 1 produced the best engines the world has ever seen. They're raw, powerful, revvy, and in my opinion, the best sounding engines ever. But how on earth did they make them able to reach over 19,000 RPM? And why aren't they in current F1 cars? Well, let me explain. The V10 era started in 1986 with the 3.5 litre unit built by Alfa Romeo, but it really started finding success in 1989 with Renault. At this time, the engine regulations were actually pretty free, with one key rule keeping them in check. The overall engine capacity could not be more than 3.5 litres, and turbos were banned. And with the engine rules being so free, the engine manufacturers each landed on pretty different designs, with V8s, V10s and V12s all on the same grid. And at one point they even had a W12, but to be fair it kind of sucked and never actually qualified for a race. Ford at the time swore by a V8 for its simplicity and relative fuel economy, whereas Ferrari stuck to a V12 with complexity and cost not really being an issue for them. They aimed at maximum power. And you can see why they chose those engines by looking at their road cars at the time. Renault were the first to really make waves with the V10, where they started to create significantly more power than the V8s and the V12s. But why? They were all 3.5 litre naturally aspirated engines, how were they creating more power? Well, it actually comes down to the specific design of the V10 engine. So let me explain. The recipe for power in a naturally aspirated engine is torque times RPM divided by a constant. So you can increase power by adding displacement, like in an American muscle car, where they run them at lower revs but with much larger engines. But in F1, you had a limit on displacement at 3.5 litres. So this means that once you've got your engine working correctly and the combustion working correctly, it's harder to create much more torque. So engine manufacturers decided they were going to push for higher RPM. And that makes sense. If you can't increase the force the crank turns at, you may as well turn it more times per second. But of course, it's not that simple. If you just removed the rev limiter from your road car and floored it on your driveway, you would have a very broken engine very quickly. That happens for two main reasons. Firstly, the pistons, conrods and crank are all designed to work up to a fixed speed. So even in your Ford Focus, the pistons are traveling at 35 miles an hour inside your engine. And they're going from 30 miles an hour to zero at the top of the stroke and then accelerating the other way. So the loads on the pistons are pretty large. So if you flew past the rev limit, these could basically explode explode or snap the conrod or any number of other metal snapping ways. Second reason is to do with the valves. They're pushed by the cam lobes and are pushed back by these valve springs. They, as well, are designed for a particular engine speed. So if you go above this, you get something called valve float, essentially meaning the valve doesn't return back to its position in time. This can lead to a loss in power as the gases in the chamber can escape too early, or even worse, the piston can smash into the valves. And in a battle between a 35 mile an hour piston and a teeny tiny little valve, the piston always wins, banging the valves and costing you a lot in mechanic bills. Or in Formula One terms, a big engine failure. So you can see why F1 engineers couldn't take their existing engines and just add a zero to the RPM limit. And so the engine manufacturers began working on these issues, coming up with pneumatic valve timing rather than relying on the old springs. This meant they had to install a pneumatic pump to the car, but it meant they could control the valves much better at higher RPM. It then meant that they wouldn't bend the valves like you might do in your road car. This system has developed a lot over time, but the basic concept is still used today. They also started using various exotic metals in the engines, things like titanium, aluminium, and beryllium, all used for their better thermal properties, meaning they didn't expand or contract too much with temperature, and also for how strong they were for their weight. And so the engineers began solving these issues and slowly started increasing the rev limits on their cars. One thing they could do to get their engines running faster was to change the bore and stroke of the engine. The bore is essentially the diameter of the piston, and the stroke is basically the difference between the top and bottom points that that piston goes through. To reduce the speeds in the engine, you can decrease the stroke, meaning that the engine can rev faster without breaking anything. But to keep the displacement from changing, you need to increase the bore, or the size of the piston. Now, bear with me. If the bore and the stroke are the same, we call that a square engine. But F1 teams actually run with an over-square setup, even to this day. So, a larger bore than the stroke, as it allows for much higher RPM. Anyway, back to the early V10s. Compared to the V12s and V8s, raising the rev limit was a little easier. And that's down to the V10 layout. Compared to the V8, the V10 means two more cylinders, 
obviously, which with a fixed engine displacement means smaller cylinders. With them being smaller, it means they are typically lighter, meaning that the conrods, pistons and wrist pins don't need to be quite as beefy. So with the reduction in weight and the valves being kept out of the way by the pneumatic system, the engine could spin much, much faster. Of course, you might be thinking, surely the V12s have much smaller pistons. And yes, they do, but they couldn't get the engines revving quite as fast. The V12s have the penalty of more rotating mass and more complexity, meaning they never quite got to the same RPM as the V10s. But there was another benefit to the V10s, the reason so many people love them. They sound incredible. Interestingly, the V10 sounds like it does because of this layout. They typically rev higher like the LFA road car does. Of course, also have a layout of five cylinders in each bank. And unlike the V12, which has six cylinders in each bank, the V10 is not fully balanced, meaning it sounds a bit more interesting than the smooth purr of the V12. Anyway, you listen. See what I mean? And so all of this engineering combined is what allowed the V10s to eventually rise up to 19,000 RPM. Putting that into perspective, that's three times higher than your typical road car and twice the highest revving production car, no matter what your Civic owning mate might tell you. These speeds mean that the piston is doing 70 miles an hour inside the engine. And at that speed, the G-force means it effectively weighs two and a half tons. Meaning that despite the ridiculous metals, the conrods actually stretch by up to one millimeter per stroke. I've actually driven quite a few V10s from this era and they are my favorite. The cars and the engines are just so raw and violent. The cars are super light with carbon monocoques, of course, and engines that only weigh 95 kilograms and plenty of aerodynamic grip. They actually rev so high that you have to adjust your hearing to the car. And often people upshift way too early when they get in one as they simply don't expect the engine to be able to rev that high. By the way, if you haven't yet entered our competition to drive a Formula One car, you can do that in the link below. We've now sold 75% of the entrance, so make sure you get your ticket as I'm not sure if we'll do this again. But the other thing about the cars from this era is that they just weren't as refined as they are today. They ran with really stiff suspension and not as much downforce as they have today. So they were a real handful. But in my opinion, all of that adds up to the fun of driving them. Anyway, why did the V10 era die? Well, to get engines to rev this high, it took lots of development. And so in turn, loads and loads of money. The teams were spending hundreds of thousands of pounds on exotic materials just for one engine. Then spending thousands on processing to ensure the parts didn't melt or wear through. The teams even had to test every component's natural frequency as the vibrations in the engine were so high that they could spontaneously fail under normal running conditions. Now, all of this meant that developing a Formula One engine was just way too much for many manufacturers. And Formula One could see this becoming an issue. So in 2006, the FIA brought in the 2.4 litre V8 in hope to get costs down and entice manufacturers back into the sport. Initially, not a lot changed. They still revved high and sounded pretty good. Maybe not V10 level, but that's a discussion for another day. And actually, Cosworth broke the 20,000 RPM barrier with their engine, using loads of crazy technology, which came at enormous expense. So later, F F1 brought in RPM limits in the rules to get rid of the advantage that the big spending teams had. Initially, this limit was 19,000 RPM, then 18, then 17, and now it's 15,000 RPM. It's a shame for the sound and the rawness of the cars, but I guess better for Formula One as a whole. You should check out this video about the evolution of F1 engines from what they looked like in 1950 all the way to today. Thanks to Masterworks for sponsoring and thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.